Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, this is the start of my presentation um, that I've been asked to do for the uh, Bass Angler Sport Fishing Society for their AGM. Um, they wanted me to talk about finding the features for bass marks, so that's that's precisely what I've done for you. Um, so who am I, first of all? So uh, Mark Cowling, I'm a, I'm a professional uh, lure fishing guide, bass lure fishing guide. Uh, I've been a, I've been full time now for four years. Uh, I've been doing it for five years. Um, I've fished exclusively with lures for bass for thirty years now. Um, I act in a consultancy capacity for various companies: Veals, Lure Fishing for Bass, Savage Gear. I've been a feature writer for Sea Angler Magazine and Total Sea Fishing Magazine. Uh, I've conceived and, and designed a couple of lures as well with Tom Cooper at 2C Lures. So you might have seen the needle fish out there and the new one, the, the surface lure, which is a zip wake. Um, and I've also written two books, uh, The Lure of the Bass. Um, my most recent is Bass Lure Fishing, A Guide to Respective Volume 1. Um, I'll be hopefully writing Volume 2 end of this year. So that's who I am. So the... The actual meeting itself, or the actual presentation, sorry, is, is aimed at new members. Um, I've been informed that there's lots of new members this year. So, again, that, that's, that's where I'm sort of you know, pitching this presentation, I would say. Um, none of us, you know, we, we don't, none of us knows everything. That we're always learning. So, you know, if I did a presentation next year, there'd be something new in it, no doubt, lots of new things. So what I'm going to talk about is initially I'm going to explain the considerations when looking for for bass marks. And then what I'm going to go into is describing six very different types of underwater terrain or, or grounds that bass like to inhabit. Uh, and I'm going to use Google Earth. So the feet, we're going to be looking at the features on Google Earth. Um, one thing that's quite important is a lot of my clients are unaware of the fact that if you've got Google Earth actually on your desktop, so not on a tablet or a, a mobile phone, lots of people have got it on those two. Um, but if you've actually got the desktop version, it means you've got access to all the historic data, um, which means you can click through lots of different images of the same mark. So you can see on, you know, when it's um, low tide, mid tide, on a rough day, a calm day, whatever. So um, very useful. So desktop version is what I've been using. Um, and the other thing is um, I've basically chosen these venues. So I've been scouring around Europe looking for looking for the sort of features I'm going to describe within these types of marks. Um, but I can assure you that none of them are in the UK. I can promise you that because I don't want to annoy anybody by them thinking that I'm you know, showing their marks or anything. So that the, these places, they are in Europe, but they're not in the UK. Um, something that I'll talk about as well is whether I consider these marks to be day or night fishing venues. I do a lot of night fishing with my clients. Um, I'll also talk about um, inducive periods within the tidal cycle as well um, on the types of, of terrain um, again you know I mean this is about going to be about a 30 minute 35 minute brief um, so I'm skipping through things really um, but um, yeah there'll be a, there's a lot more info uh, I'll go into much much greater detail in both of my books that you can see there so initial considerations that I talked about then so uh, safety is the is the biggest one um, when I go out on my own, um, if I'm especially if I'm on the open coast and I'm stood on rocks, um, then I'll always be wearing a, a life jacket, um, self-inflating one as well. So if I do go in the water, it's gonna it's gonna inflate. Uh, I always carry with me a, a personal locator beacon, and that's always registered with the relevant coast guard. It's not just for me; it's also for my clients. You know, if we you know most of the places we go, we don't have a mobile phone. So if someone does hurt themselves, then I want to be able to call in the, uh, the coast guard, etc. Another aspect to safety is, personally, I'd always fish any new marks on an ebbing tide. That way, you're not going to get cut off. Uh, and also, just in your planning, just check the swell and the weather forecast, uh, and also check the, the tide times as well. So, something that I think is, is it is imperative, this, especially when you're using a subsurface lure, um, is, is always try to ascertain the direction of the tide. If there's any tidal influence involved, so if you're on the open coast, you know, on a headland or, or anything like that, or an estuary or whatever, always consider which way the tide is 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 running, is flowing, because you know it's very rare that I'll see bass swimming against the tide. I mean, sometimes I might just I've seen them just sort of like positioning onto features, swimming against the tide briefly alongside mullet, 
obviously if they're chasing bait fish and things like that they'll just swim in any direction but it's rare that you'll see them swimming against the tide so for that reason if i'm using particularly subsurface lures i'll always keep the lure moving in the same direction as the tide you want you want the bass to see the lure first and not the line or anything else um also um there'll be certain places certain marks that will be more conducive to daylight fishing and certain conditions and, and marks that will be better for darkness um generally speaking and i'm going to say that quite a lot in this brief generally speaking um you will i tend to find that if i'm fishing during the day i'm quite happy to have the wind in my face and i'll generally be looking for a bit of white water a bit of movement to the water so out on the open coast in an estuary mouse things like that you know I'll, i want a bit of movement to the water so i don't mind having the wind in my face whereas if i'm fishing uh, at, at night I prefer to be out of the wind or no wind at all or just fishing very sheltered venues. And I tend to be fishing places where the water's very calm and very clear. Um, something that you might not have heard of, to be honest, up until a few years ago, I'd never heard of this myself, but uh, biotic and abiotic factors. So a biotic factor is living things within an ecosystem. So that can be, um, you know, bass themselves, the other fish that are surrounding them, uh, and then what they eat, so crustaceans, you know, prawns, limpets, mollusks, you know, all everything around them basically that's living. Whereas the abiotic factor, uh, that's other things associated, associated to the environment, uh, which are non-living. So non-living components are the a- abiotic factors. And that can be things like sea temperature, air temperature, the water clarity, the light levels, air pressure, how much fresh water is in, in the seawater, all those kind of things so when you consider biotic and abiotic factors a lot comes into play um for me and again this is you know pitching this at a newcomer so i would say for a lure angler not so much a bait angler for bass but a lure angler there's four key moments in the season um the first one would be the post spawning period so that's that's when the bass are moving back in you know it's depending on where you are in the UK, you could be talking March, April, maybe further north, you're talking later in the season. But um, post-spawning um, and actually spawning, they'll be returning to the regular haunts. And once they spawn, those bass are going to be hungry, you know? So that's that's when they're going to be, you know, they will be more active. Um, and then the next um, key moment in the season, I think, is when the sea temperature is really rapidly rising, which is normally sort of mid-May, mid-June, if we get a nice hot spell, and that tends to coincide as well with the sand deals turning up. Um, and I find once the water temperature gets below uh, above about 12 degrees centigrade, that's that's when the bass really do become active. In, in my part of the world down here in South Devon, um, you know, the bass are a little bit lethargic when the water temperature is below 10 degrees. Certainly if it gets anywhere near nine, they're very lethargic. But 10 degrees is sort of like the, the sort of when they just start turning on a bit. Once you get to 12 degrees, that's when you can expect them to really start feeding. And then that water temperature really does rise in, in sort of June sort of time. Um, the next key moment in the season, <clears> I would <throat> say, would be uh, when the mackerel and the sprat turn up on mass. Um, it varies from year to year. On average, down here in South Devon, it's in, in August. Um, last year, it wasn't until early September, year before, uh, when it was very settled. We, I think it was uh, very early July. Um, but what it means is if you've got mackerel hoarding sprat up into, you know, right in close to the coastline, again, that can just turn the bass wild. So it is a key moment, I think. And if the, if the weather's settled around that period, the bass can stay in shore close by for a very long time. Um, and then the next key moment, I believe, is, is the pre-breeding period. So when the, you know, when the bass are really feeding up, so towards the end of the season, again, if you're further north, it might be September, October. Down here, you're talking November, December, you know, that that's when... Yeah, the fish are really, the bigger fish as well tend to turn up. The small ones disappear. God, I don't know where they go. I really don't. But the big ones, if you catch a bass in November, December, it's generally going to be a better sized fish. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about territorial and transitory bass here. Now, if you've, if you've read my second book, you'll know what I'm talking about here. But a territorial bass is just that. I think it's one that is more or less a resident fish, uh, whether it's there all year round um, or certainly for a a, 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 you know a good percentage of the year i think that's likely to be the case if it's territorial uh you tend to find territorial bass will be hanging around rough grounds weed shallow areas intertidal areas uh, and those sorts of bass territorial bass are the ones that i think are hab- habitual in nature you know so they're sticking to predetermined routes 
um, you know, certain beaches, certain reefs, all that kind of thing. Um, clearly, those sort of fish are at risk of capture, you know, by other anglers that do keep them, nets, spear fishermen, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I do tend to find that rough ground, rough terrain in general is where you're going to find territorial fish. The more cover, the better. More cover, more food in rough ground areas. Whereas a transitory bass is one that is, is transient in nature, so it's not always there. Um, again, I tend to find that if you're, if you're fishing – or if you're fishing over cleaner ground, sands, deeper water, clean ground, that kind of thing, um, that's where you're more likely to find transitory bass. And, and what they're doing is basically following the bait fish around. So they're following the lance, the sand eels, the mackerel, sprat, whatever. And I think the transitory fish are the ones that you'll find basically moving around the UK as the season goes on. And then they move back round again as well as it starts cooling off. Um, so places like headlands, deep water headlands, estuary mouths, places where there's current, I think that's where you're more likely to find transitory fish. And, um, you know, last season, for instance, there, there was very few bait fish around. And when they were there, you would you would catch bass in the usual places, turn up the next day, bait fish were gone, the bass were gone as well. Year before, there was loads and loads of bait fish around, um, never seen so much. And you could almost guarantee that if you turned up on a particular headland, if there was bait fish there, if you saw mackerel or anything like that, bang, you started catching bass. So stick or twist. So what am I going on about here? Well, it, it links in quite nicely with territorial and transitory bass because I would say that if you're sticking with a venue, it means that you're you're waiting for the bass to come to you. So that could be a fish that's territorial. So you're just stood in one spot, cast into a particular region, waiting for the fish to come to you. Whereas the twist element, that's when you're then where you're moving around. You're trying to find the fish. So if the fish are moving, uh, you know, different headlands, different bays, all that kind of stuff. If you don't catch, you know, within the first 10, 15 minutes or whatever, that's when you're moving around. Is there an ultimate type of venue? Um, I, I would say that, I mean, everyone talks about tide. Um, I would say there are occasions when bass do move out of the tide, which I'll talk about later in this presentation. But um, I would say the ultimate type of venue would be somewhere where there's there's lots of flow, lots of natural flow, but there's lots of places, you know, within the seabed where they can just duck in, hide, hide within, hide under, whatever, just to pick stuff off in the tide. Um, be, be very specific. Um, in my first book, The Lure of the Bass, I basically chronicled you know, how I learned how to consistently catch these fish on lures. And I think one of the components was that the, the more accurate I was, uh, or more precise I was with where I where I cast the lure and when I put it there, the more successful I became. And that really is what, you know, that's what this brief is all about. It's picking six different types of marks. And then building the portfolio. I mean, I've, I've probably got about 180 odd marks at the last count that I um, fish myself or, or guide clients on. <clears throat> excuse me and and i would say that they probably all meet one of about 10 to 12 blueprints so you know and and six of those i'm describing to you in this brief basically um so once once you've once you've got a particular type of mark you could then look let's just say it's a daylight mark you know you can then look for one that faces different wind directions if the wind is coming from the north then great you've got a, a similar venue you know than the one that you've already been you fishing and had success on that faces south so that that's basically how i build the portfolio is i look for very similar marks they're orientated in a different way on the coast whether i'm looking for shelter or whether i'm looking for you know the mark to be exposed um so lastly I, i've already said it three or four times but you will hear me say generally speaking or in general quite a lot in this presentation um and that is because obviously i can't cover all eventualities so the first type of mark that I'm going to describe then is a, an intertidal reef. So one where that is, you know, exposed at low tide that you can walk on. Um, and I'd say a good 70 to 80 percent of my marks encompass places where I can actually walk on at low tide. Um, I think it's the greatest advantage that the, the bass low angler has got really over these fish is that you can actually stand on the ground that you're catching them or you can interrogate it on Google Earth or take photographs, etc. So um, I tend to find or I do find that intertidal reefs. Uh, you can fish them across the full tidal cycle. So you can fish them from low tide all the way up to high and all the way back down again. That's the type of mark that I'm describing here. Um, we've caught bass on them day or night. Again, daylight fishing tends to be when it's the water's a bit rougher, a bit murkier. The bass are less wary. 
um, or if, if it is very calm and clear during the day, then it's we're generally catching them on surface lures or soft plastic lures, fish very naturally. But um, at night, it's, it's, it can be anything, you know, needle fish, soft plastics, hard lures, whatever. But uh, it all depends on the conditions. But the biggest thing here is just think about your stance. So if you are going to be casting over an intertidal reef, you know, think about the, the your initial stance, the platform you're going to stand on. And then obviously the biggest thing of all is, is think of safety. So you, know, you won't really find me standing on rocks at night. Um, I do fish a lot from beaches, casting over re intertidal reefs at night, but I don't tend to stand on rocks. Uh, territorial bass, yeah, as I've already discussed, I would say that, um, you know, the rougher the ground, the weedier the ground, the more food that's on that ground, the more likely that a territorial bass is going to pick up on the same things that you've picked up on. Things like um, gobies and crabs in particular, you know, there's all, all sorts of different types of crabs, small fish, etc. But those two, I think, form, especially with these reefs, a big part of a bass's diet. Um, <coughs> Going through my notes, something that I've I've picked up on over the last, you know, particularly the last 15 years is, is that the midpoint in in the tide, be it the flood or the ebb, tends to be the most productive, um, and and I believe that's because of the um, the increased velocity of the tide, you know, the fish are moving in, moving out quicker, you know, that's what they're doing is they're utilising the tide most of the time to feed, I believe, um, well certainly to move around over these reefs anyway, um. So I tend to find that over low water, and this has been confirmed by my uh, a lot of my diver friends, is that the fish tend to be much further out at, at, towards low tides. They've moved off of the reef, they move out, they're just sitting amongst the weed or sitting amongst you know the sand patches, things like that, and they're pretty much dormant over the low tide period. Um, and then, like I said, as the tide picks up, then the fish move in. You know, <coughs> um, over high tide. I tend to find that the fish are very much sat in little pockets. So, you know, you could almost say that on the flood or the ebb, you might be st stood in one spot, cast into a certain feature on an intertidal reef. Um, but then over the high tide period, that's when you need to sort of do the cast and the move. So that's where you're sort of twisting, you know, you're, you're, you're casting and moving, looking for the pockets of fish. They're not moving to you, they're not coming to you because they're not using the force of the tide. You need to go looking for them. Hope that makes sense. Um, so what you're looking at, you'll see why I've colour coded these um, these next headings in a minute. But what you're looking for on these intertidal reefs are uh, natural submerged passageways leading into it. So natural passageways that lead in from the deep water um, that lead naturally into the reef. Um, within the reef itself, you're looking for interlinking gullies, culverts. Some of them might only be six inches to a foot deep, you know, or, or deeper or below like the main um, platform of reef. But these little gullies and culverts, these are the sort of things that the bass will use to navigate and hunt. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll patrol through them and they'll also position within, within them as well. So talking about positioning, I mean, you'll have lots of like rock pools, depressions and various little sand patches and things like that along these intertidal reefs. So if you've got a very obvious pool or depression, then, you know, I'd hazard a guess if the bass are on the feed at some, at some period in the tide, they're gonna interrogate it. Um, if you've got any protruding rocks, you know, at any point in the tide, um, and there's, especially if there's a bit of white water, you know, a little bit of movement to the water, and it's it's splashing around the rocks, it's creating a, a lovely aerated uh, fist up conditions, um, then, you know, that's always going to be somewhere. If, if there's a depression or a, an interlinking gully close to a, a protruding rock, that is where I'll be putting my lure. Um, weed beds as well, like I said, you know, the, ba the bass do love to sit in weed, you know, whether they're just digesting or just, you know, waiting to, to strike, I don't know, waiting to pounce on something, but, you know, they do love sitting in weed beds. So if there's any obvious weed bed like that or, um, you know, it, it's within a depression or anything, again, that's where I'll be putting the lure. Um, sometimes these areas are difficult to reach at high tide, but as the tide, you know, early into the flood or certainly it late in the ebbing tide, if you've got a reef and then it drops off into deeper water, it's amazing how many times the bass will just sit right on the edge of that, you know, that drop off, uh, you know, and they're looking just to pick stuff off as it's coming off the reef, you know, so great areas. So that is a perfect example of an intertidal reef uh, that has all of those elements to it. So. As you can see, you've got the, uh, the passageways in the green, 
it's a bit yellow there apologies but yeah that is green so you can see the natural passageways coming in look from the deeper water and then moving positioning right into those reefs so to me that would just be a very natural place to put a lure uh the interlinking gullies and culverts you can see that there's a little gully there that links those two and amongst the rocks you've got another very prominent feature that cuts through the reef there you know whether that's going to be submerged at low tide i'm not sure but if it is you might have another one there you could say um but that link that there that links into like the main passageways that's again that, that intersection as well be put in the lures um pools and depressions i can clearly see there's some deeper sections there and there again it'd be amazing how, how close in these fish will be at times um protruding rocks i would say those there are protruding over high tide so again you're gonna have a lovely bit of white water washing around here if it's rougher nice little nice little natural passageway there weed just beautiful um weed beds there look weed beds there as well right in the middle of the passageways what more could you ask for uh and then the drop off as well so you could be you know at the start of, at the start of the flood you could be fishing right on the edge here waiting for the fish just to turn up you know putting your lures into these little zones here you know right at the entrance to the passageways that'd be where the bass would be coming in first and then on the ebb and tide you could just be following the tide out and again it'd be amazing how often the bass will be just hanging around the edge of these of that main section of the reef so there's a good example of a uh, that bass was remember it was 68 centimeters and that was caught over a reef that was very very similar to that and basically what i was asking my client to do was just continually cast a needle fish uh into a gully that ran at 45 degrees to the beach so he was he was the tide was ebbing it was coming from the left so he was casting the uh up tide so he was casting it um towards you know the, the direction of the flow and making sure the lure was moving in the same direction as the flow and basically the lure was just, just was just traveling straight up that gully straight up that passageway and uh, that was the result and that was his that was his personal best bass so the next uh, type of environment or uh, terrain that i want to talk about is contrasting zones uh, and what i'm talking about here is basically casting a lure from a beach uh, whereby you're casting over so the beach would be shingle or sand, uh, but it, what you would have is very distinct areas of reef, sand and weed. So covering you know, the ground in front of you. Um, a lot of these sort of beaches are like horseshoe shaped coves in this part of the world. And I'd say the more secluded, the better. Um, some of them I can only get to, you know, maybe only I could probably stay on them for maybe an hour and a half over high tide, something like that. Um, you know, I'm very careful. But yeah, the more secluded, the better, I would say. Um, they generally fish best two hours either side of high tide, and I think that's pretty much just because all of the features are, that you know that we're going to be casting over are, are covered at the time. Um, for me, they're a favoured nighttime haunt. I do love fishing these these types of venues at night with clients as well. Um, <coughs> I again, I think they're more likely to be the domain of a territorial bass. Uh, and what I find is that there's two types of these sort of beaches. So you've got the ones that are very, very sheltered. So the, the if you can imagine a horseshoe shaped bay, and I'll show you one in, in, in a set on, on the next slide, where you've got two sort of you know extremities at either end of the beach, two sort of promontories that are sticking out. The main run of tide will be running past those main headlands, mini headlands, if you like. So the actual tidal influence is minimal. Um, that's actually coming into that little little bay, that little cove. But something that I've found is that particularly an hour before high tide is the bass will move out of the main flow. So as, as the flow of the current slows down, these bass will move into very quiet little areas. And I think it's just purely because they know it's an easy meal in there for them. Um, and some of these marks, honestly, you can almost you can almost set your watch by when the bass are going to move into them sometimes. Um, it's not always that easy, of course. Um, but there's other types of these coves where that are exposed all the time to tidal influence. And these are the sorts of ones where you get tend to get waves of bass moving in. So it backs up my theory that the fish are just using the tide all the time to move around the coastline. They're not swimming against it, they're just swimming with it, using the power and the, the force of the tide. So if you've got a, 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 beat, a bay or a, or a horseshoe shaped cove that I'm on about here, and the, and the tide is running straight into it, you'll just get waves of fish. You might get a hit or a bite or 
you might catch one you know if i've got a couple of clients fishing they both might catch and then it'll just go quiet for 20 30 minutes and then you know half an hour later bang you'll get another fish so these um these contrasting zones then if you if we've on the reefy sections you've got uh movable rocks then if there's crabs under those rocks and the gobies then if, if there's crabs there particularly the velvet swimming crab crabs so the red eyes the horrible ones uh and the and the edible crabs if you've got those two types of crabs on a reef system that's you know within one of these little coves then i reckon there's a really good chance that the bass will know about it um in a similar way to the, the intertidal reef if you've got natural passageways or routes that run into these these little coves again that's advantageous and one of the biggest things here is it's amazing how many times you'll get a hit as the lure is transiting from one zone to another so if you can imagine like you've got your shingle beach you're casting from and then reef in front of you and then sand let's say it's amazing how many times you'll get a hit as it as the lure transits from the sand to the reef or even much closer into you as the lure is coming off of the reef and then coming into the shingle the clean ground in front of you it might only be sometimes you know four or five meters out sometimes it's amazing how often that's when you get a hit so that's the sort of beach that i'm talking about sorry about that so the um the red circle there you can clearly see that that's sort of you know broken ground lots of broken stones particularly there there's probably a lot of little gullies and broken you know movable stones there i definitely expect a lot of crabs and stuff to be in that area um you can see via the pink arrows this is that, that's a very very natural passageway that's coming straight in there you've got a couple more here one there look and another one here so there's all sorts of angles that the fish could could move in there uh, and the reason that i've got those those orange arrows is is, is backing up just what i said then on you'd be so it's amazing how often that, that is where you get the bite that's where you get the hit it's as that lure is moving off of that reef onto that shingle crazy and that there is a classic example that was a, a bass caught in november quite a chilly night uh, a few years ago now by a guy called dave uh, and again he cast out the wave worm the little white um five inch worm and he and i kept saying to him just keep putting it right in right in you know right into this gully there was convergence there of of like uh, pebbles and in reef and then as the lure was coming out of that gully off of the reef and back onto the shingle we were stood on bang that's where he got that hit so the next type of mark I'm going to talk about is uh, an estuary mouth. <coughs> Excuse me, bit of COVID here at the moment. So, um, so I'm talking about large expanses rather than um, you know narrow little sort of streams coming down and onto shingle beaches. I'm talking about quite quite large expanses of 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 sand, you know, with sandbars, troughs you know, various um, channels and that kind of thing. So quite quite big estuary mouths. Some of them will dry out completely at low tide, uh, where some will always have water in them. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, what I tend to find uh, is the great, greatest concentrations of bass or the most regular catches tend to be on the early flood or on, on the late ebb. Now, and again, it could just be as simple as the fact that on the early flood, the bass are a bit further out they're just waiting for that first push of the tide before moving into the river uh, and then they just move in uh, and again on the late air they're just waiting to the very last moment you know they're just sucking up the last of the sand eels or anything else just getting dragged out of there so that that does make sense um day or night venues and um, what i tend to find by day is this type of venue is you know frequented by lots of boats kayakers um paddle boarders and the like um so my, my preference for fishing estuary mouth is definitely at night much quieter um i would say because of the amount of tidal movement uh, within an estuary mouth you're more likely to encounter transitory bass um purely because you know you're going to get like i said the bait fish are going to get washed in and washed out you know and the bass will know that so big shows of transitory bass chasing bait fish that's my thinking there However, you know, it's well known that that um, some big, big bass come from estuary marriage, you know, and I, again, I think the bigger, cleverer fish, they know where the food is more likely to be, you know, and you, what you also find as well is that early in the season when they're spawning, later in the season, as we talked about when they're, when they're feeding up, you know, 
estuary mode there's a lot of food within estuary mode lots of small fish lots of crabs um you know these fish are clever they know where the food is um i would say the main channel or main channels there's, there's normally quite a few of them they are they are always the good places to put the lure and um, what i would find is that uh, on an estuary mode particularly a deeper water one is if you can get safe access to um you know where that and you can actually cast you know to it. it could be quite a long way out sometimes but that's when needle fish or you know the savage gear pencils and that kind of stuff you know that cast a mile um if you can if you can target that ridge that drop off and almost um again you might have read this in my second book um if you can sort of retrieve that lure along the trajectory of where the ridge or where it just drops off into that deeper water that tends to be where the fish are swimming along so they're not necessarily swimming in the middle of the channel they tend to swim right on the edge of it um and something that i only really um identified a few a couple of years ago now was basically the back eddying effect of 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 the tide um within estuary mouse but if you've if you've got like little bays along the estuary mouth itself as the tide's pushing in it sort of interacts with the land and it does back eddy on itself i think you see it in rivers and stuff like that and anywhere where the water is uh back eddying you might see it on very very calm days that's, that's a good time to spot it um anywhere where the water's back eddying again off that's where we've had some really good catches you know and again i just think this is they know that's where bait fish and stuff's going to be disorientated um also if you've got any more isolated or solitary features um you know out on the sand itself or you know, on the edge of the channel or anything like that. Again, that's where I'd be aiming the lure. You know, just think like, where would these fish sit in ambush? Something. Sort of think like these fish sometimes, all the time actually. Um. So like I said, because of the amount of natural tidal movement, you do tend to find that there's short windows of activity. You know, you might only find that a certain estuary might might only fish for an hour. You know, on the flood or half an hour on the ebb or something like that. That might you might be lucky enough that, you know, it, it tends to fish quite well. For two or three periods within the tide you know but they tend to be short windows of activity and again that that is down to the amount of tide something that is really good though is that if you're gonna catch bass all year round and again i, I appreciate that in certain parts of the country this this you know this is unrealistic you're not going to do it necessarily but you know we're lucky enough down in this part of the world that you, you we can catch them all year round and um you know the estuary mounds are where i do concentrate quite a lot of my effort um you know in the in the middle of the winter so that would be again a classic sort of you know massive sandy expanse of a channel that sort of skirt out it's always there that that channel um you can see by the pink arrows there i've just marked out the edges of the of the channels so again that would be the sort of route i'd expect the fish to be taken rather than they obviously will come through the middle as well but i think they're all they're always looking for a meal when they're moving they're always looking for an easy meal and if they're going to find something it's going to be on the edge of these channels i think um the star there that's again you can see a classic lovely little bay little horseshoe shaped bay so as the tide moves in and out of there it's going to interact with it and it's going to swirl you know so even though there's not a lot of features in there Fact that the water is going to back eddy and swirl in that area that would be somewhere that i would concentrate on particularly at night <coughs> and then i've also marked out four or five sort of solitary features that just stick out in the tide out in the channel there look and again this is just somewhere that i've just found you know i've, I've scoured google earth and i've found these marks you know so this this is what you would need to do to find your own marks and uh, that beauty there that was nearly eight pound that one and that was actually using a Savage Gear line through sand hill. And I kept saying to the guy, just keep casting straight out because the tide was about to turn. And I knew as soon as the lure, um, when I say straight out, I said to him, keep casting out at 12 o'clock because I knew the tide was about to turn. And as soon as the lure moved and was dragged around to his left, I said, right, no, start casting to your right. And literally, within a few casts, once that tidal movement had just picked up at the uh, the turn of the ebb and tide there the turn of the tide and he was aiming the lure right along the ridge as i talked about where it drops off into very deep water and uh yeah that was the result that was the result beautiful fish so going up into the estuaries then uh lagoons and brackish environments um so brackish if you're unaware uh, that's where you know where you've got fresh water meets meets salt water essentially um 
longer, further up the estuaries. Um, what I tend to find is that, you know, they, these can be fantastic places to catch bass, but there's some serious, serious homework that has to go into working out the patterns of behaviour. Um, quite similar, really, to fishing over reefs. You know, there's just there's so many places that the bass could be within within the set periods and the tide that, like I say, some there's, there's certain places where that are more conducive, or you know, the bass will generally hang out. Um, but there's also sometimes they do turn up in some rather strange places sometimes, especially on the really big tides. You know, they can be a long way up the estuaries, long way up these creeks. You know. Sometimes you can be fishing in very, very shallow water. Um, you know, they do turn up in some odd places. So yeah, a lot, a lot of homework. Um, I would say there's a great, greater likelihood of catching a territorial bass, um, you know, within these lagoons, saltwater lagoons, uh, you know, in a long way up these estuaries. Um, I do think that once these bass are uh, within them, especially the bigger, deeper estuaries, I think they're staying in, in these places, you know, not all, not all year, but some of them they do. Um, but you know, in the really deep water estuaries, like the Tamar, for instance, um, you know, the River Dart, I think there's, there's definitely bass in there all year round, you know, and they're breeding in there as well, you know. So I think if 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 they were born in there essentially, then I think they a lot of the time they are staying in these estuaries all the time. So that's the reason for the territorial fish. Um, but if you get the the bait fish, the sand eels earlier in the season and then the sprat later in the season. If they get chased by the mackerel, hoarded by the mackerel inside the estuaries and then further up into, into the river systems, into brackish water, um, believe me, I, I've, I've been stood in almost fresh water having mackerel bouncing off my legs. That's so, sometimes how far they will come up chasing the bait fish. But if you get mackerel and sprat or mackerel and sand eels um, within a lagoon or brackish water environment, then um, that's when the transitory bass, the bass will follow them in. And if you if you get those two types of bass within a a river system, then poof, you, you're going to catch a lot of bass. Um, day or night, I do fish these marks day or night. Um, I don't actually, I don't really have a preference. I've got to be honest with you. Um, yep, yeah, don't mind. Again, these are the sorts of things that I'm looking for. So the back eddying areas, the mini coves. So the bottlenecks are where the um, you know the water is getting funneled, naturally funneled into certain areas uh, or diverted um, channels. Um, the actual channels themselves. Um, think of like a you know muddy expanse, like a channel that's cut through it. If there's any sort of um, you know kinks or bends, or if there's a convergence between the, the channel and then like a lesser channel or a culvert running off of a muddy creek or um, you know, running off of a muddy expanse, I would say, then again, that, that's where I'll be putting that lure, you know. Um, weedy margins, um, it might it might sound obvious, it might not, but, you know, I've, I've watched bass, good ones as well, regularly, just shuffling along, sn you know, sniffing through the weed almost, you know, nudging rocks, nudging the weed, looking for crabs, things like that, you know. If they don't see you, then they're just, you know, they're happily just swimming around and looking and it's crabs that's what they're after in the weedy margins they're looking for crabs small fish as well but mostly crabs um so regions of sporadic weed bed weed bed sorry that are close to the flow so go all the way back to this the start of the presentation and i talked about um you know what what is the ideal venue if you can imagine you've got lots of natural flow you know within a saltwater lagoon um and then you've got like clumps of weed or you know rocks and stuff that they can hide under or around you know, they're, they're the types of places, little clumps of weed, weed beds, it's amazing how much cover a bass can get just tucked into a, you know, a clump of weed. Um, and the other thing as well is like undulations in the seabed, you know, some of them might be temporary, some of them might be permanent, um, but wherever you're seeing like pools or mounds or pits or anywhere where there's like shellfish gathering, stuff like that, again, you know, that, that that's, they, they tend to be where the bass will hang around. And uh, I've managed to find a, an example of all of those things uh, on this slide so i'll start off with the red one so there you go that's again a little a little cove there there's another one there so as the as the water floods and ebbs out of this region it's gonna it's gonna start to back eddy particularly on that one there i'd say there's your classic bottleneck there's a bridge there and narrows in so the water's going to get funneled you know any bait fish in that region especially if there's a you know a, a powerful tide running then you know they're going to get smashed through there um, that's another good thing about lagoons and, and estuaries actually as well, or estuary mouths, is that, you know, if it's a neat tide, 
it doesn't matter there's always going to be a lot of a lot of tidal movement you know and i'd even say that sometimes in these the estuary mouths or the lagoons actually a neat tide is better because you know if the fish are moving with the tide then on a neat tide they're going to be moving slower you know and also there's certain places that they can hold uh, and position on a neat tide that they can't necessarily on a spring because the tide's too powerful and you know on a spring tide the fish will be moving past you very very quickly so it shortens that window of opportunity down even more sometimes so you know when people say to me mark you know our spring tides are best well again it just depends on the venue it really does um where was i channels right so you can see a classic bend in the channel there now obviously you won't be walking out across this mud but just to give you an idea of the type of bend that you uh, you're looking for there and you can quite clearly see a culvert <clears throat> voices going there uh you know linking into that channel again that would be a good spot to fish you know because anything gets sucked out of there you know the, a bass would be waiting for that similar area there look you know that uh, that sort of secondary channel links right into that main one you know what you've got there as well is like weedy margins that you can see so marked in yellow sporadic weed beds so sporadic weed beds there just dotted around uh and then you've got the classic sort of there's undulations there i mean that arguably is another little mini channel but you know that that is an undulation in the seabed you know so the water as it flows in over the top of that you know it's, it's going to move the water is going to move around that and there you go that was a beauty that was the 10th um bass over 70 centimeters that a client's had with me that was earlier this season uh, and you can see behind you, look, I mean, <laughs> you're talking about inches of water there, really. Um, you know, we had to get out across the mud, you know, always be mindful of the safety. But, um, yeah, and he actually saw that fish um, turn on the lure. So he was using a Savage Gear gravity stick paddle tail, the white one. And he said he, 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 saw, the, he saw the mouth of the fish. He saw the fish move out of the flow and just basically make a beeline for the lure. And he said all he saw was the mouth of the fish. <laughs> and then the next minute the rod was almost shacked out of his hands amazing love it right so promontories and headlands then and um, this is the fifth mark that i'm going to talk about so they can be you know the extremities you know long runs of rock on the edge of the beach um either side of the beach or they can be obviously huge imposing structures you know like major headlands that just jut out into into the tide out into the channel whatever um so again i find the middle hours of the tide and um, to be more conducive on the headlands that's when the tidal movement's at its greatest that's when the the bait fish is getting moved around whereas on the, the promontories so like the edges of the beaches i find that the early flood uh, is more conducive and i think again going back to what i said about when the bass are lying dormant at low tide you know when they're a long way out over these reefs um, you know, as the tide starts flooding in, these long promontories of rock that are on the edge of the beaches, these are the first places that the bass are going to interact with, really. So I think that's why the early flood is, is the best period on these promontories before the bass move into like onto the reefs. Um, now, this might sound really obvious, but um, be especially wary of, of the waves and the swell uh, when you're fishing these types of marks. Um, and I would only fish these places in daylight. You know, I wouldn't, I would never ever be fishing these kind of places or guiding at night, you know, from a headland. Um, it's just, it's just too iffy. Um, you know, if a wave comes in, that's it, it's gone. Um, I think if the water's, you know, 15, 20 feet deep, so if it doesn't dry out at low tide in this part of the world, obviously it would do in Jersey or something like that. Um, but 20 foot of water, I think you're more likely to come across transitory bass around these headlands um you know chasing bait fish around chasing mackerel chasing sand eels, sprat that, that kind of thing whereas i think anywhere that's intertidal so anywhere that does dry out that's when again you're more likely to find the territorial bass um as i said greater likelihood of bait fish activity you know in the stronger currents around these promontories and, and headlands again and, and this is a major thing so if you've got a headland or a promontory and then you've got protruding rocks at, at, at the exposed end of it uh if you've got if you've got a little bit of movement to the water even a little bit could just create just some beautiful conditions around these around the edges of these rocks you know so imagine a deep water headland that's got a couple of islands of rock dotted around that within casting distance you know and i mean last not last season season before when there was loads of bait fish around i mean this is what we were doing we were casting you know big surface lures out you know out in the flow where the water was getting um you know 
redirected, deflected, you know, swirling, back eddying, aerated water, you know, close to, you know, big rocks that, you know, are out in the flow. And this, this is where we were hitting lots of the bass, you know, on big surface lures. Um, but if you're, if you find yourself in a position where you're, you can cast, imagine you've got like long fingers of rock on the end of a headland or a promontory. If you can cast and retrieve that lure parallel to those rock fingers, um, you know, that, that's, that's where the bass are going to be hunting as close to the rocks as possible. And that's purely for cover and concealment. Um, and what I would find, especially in the more fizzed up, you know, aerated conditions is, you know, that's when you need to have your wits about you because a bass will very often, if it doesn't see you, then it's going to very often hit that lure right at the end of the retrieve, right on the end of the rub tip. So that would be the sort of um, conditions and the type of mark that I'd be talking about. So the red uh, star there, that would be your stance. And then you can see the directions that I'd be casting in, depending on the tide, of course. So if the tide was flowing from this direction, I'd be casting the lure up there, up there and then bringing it in through this gap, you know, and um, the pink arrows, that's the bait fish. You know, they'd be getting washed in that way. Let's just say the tide was flooding from the left, ebbing from the right. So the bait fish were getting pushed into this area, you know, and if they interact with all of this, this white water, these little white water crashing around the rocks, it's just easy, easy meat. Um, and as I see, as you can see there, look, the green arrow, uh, the green circles, that's the aerated fizz dot water zones. So again, that's where I'll be putting my lures. Basically, the less time you give a bass to make up its mind, the more positive it's going to be. You know, that's why a lot of people catch their first bass on a, you know, a piece of metal cast in the surf because the bass just doesn't get a chance to make up its mind. It just, it just sees it and out of instinct, it just hits it. That's what you want to be doing. That one there, that was 73 centimeters, that one. And you can clearly see what I'm talking about there. You know, you've got your lovely little islands of rock. You can see the amount of white water, you know, and that bass that took her Daiwa shoreline shiner, which is a hard diving minnow lure. And basically the lure hit the water and I preempted it hitting the water by tightening up on the line, bringing it with a bail arm. It literally within two turns of that handle, that fish hit that lure. Um, you know, you, you again, you'd have probably read the story of how I caught it in my first book, how I got that fish in, I'll never know. I think the bass gods are smiling, smiling on me that day because if the fish had moved to the my right, uh, as soon as I hooked it, it came up on the surface and just looked like a log in the water, to be honest, at range. And if it had gone to my right, I'd have never got it in because I'd have had to have dragged it across five different sets of fingers of rock. But luckily, it basically swam pretty much towards me on the surface. And by the time I got it into that region there, which is a bit of deeper water, I was pretty much in control of it. So about that. So the last type of venue I'm going to talk about is a temporary shallow surf beach. So you might be thinking, what is he going on about here? But um, it's probably not what you've imagined. So I, I know most of you imagine a surf beach to be, you know, a long expanse of sand, you know, mile long, whatever, lovely, lovely surf rolling in on it. Um, but what I'm talking about actually is a, a, a shingle beach, potentially with rocks either side of it. Um, that then just runs down under sand. So over high water, you know, the, the sand, the sandy area could be under 15 foot of water. But if you, as the tide is um, dropping down, particularly on the spring tide, so I'd say two or three hours either side of low tide, even if you've got a tiny amount of swell, as that water shallows over that flat sand, it, you can get some lovely, lovely surf conditions. And again, it's only temporary, just over the low tide period, because as soon as the tide starts pushing in again, and the water gets, you know, more than a couple of feet deep, then, you know, the waves won't turn. You won't have that surf. But the, these types of beaches have been absolutely brilliant. Um, again, darkness is far more productive. We, we have caught them during the day, um, but definitely at night is, is, is the time to be there. And this is when the bass will come right in close. Ideally, you want, I would say, only one or two feet of surf. One foot, actually, is probably better. Um, you know, you might be stood shin deep, casting out a needlefish lure or, you know, hard minnow, maybe, a, you know, maybe a soft plastic, depending on, um, you know, how much distance you want. Um, but I do like using the needlefish in these sort of conditions. Um, again, I think they're definitely the domain of transitory and territorial bass. Um, the transitory side of it is quite often we'll turn up on these sort of beaches and, um, you know, just before it gets dark, we'll catch some mackerel uh, on the lures. Uh, 
Um, and if that occurs, then you, you're almost guaranteed to catch a bass as soon as it gets dark. As soon as it gets dark, the bass will be there, literally to the minute. Um, so, but those sort of bass that are basically, you know, following the mackerel around, they do tend to be transitory. But the territorial side of it, and you'll see in a minute, is I do think that bass use these beaches, particularly the ones that have got promontories either side of it, as I just think they cut right across them. I think they literally go from one promontory, cut across the beach to the other promontory. And if you can put a lure in that, in that invisible line, which you'll see on the next slide, again, we've had a lot of consistency doing that. So sand eels, um, I think there's only one reason that the mackerel are in on these sort of places. Um, you know, late evening, you know, they're, you know talk, they're, they're bays, essentially. They're small bays, you know, large beaches, small bays, maybe 100 metres across, 200 metres across at the most. Um, but what, I, what we've definitely found, and it's something that I didn't even realise occurred again up until a couple of years ago, was sand eels are actually very active at night uh, over... You know over the sand particularly under a high under a, a full moon and i think that um you know the mackerel basically chase chase the sand hills into these places and then obviously the sand sand hills are trying to burrow into the sand but i think the waves are stirring them up and i also think what the bass are doing is they're coming in and not only are they utilizing the power of the, the gently breaking waves to find the sand hills but i actually think the bass are actually sort of almost nosing through the sand looking for the sand hills um the reason I think that is we do foul hook some bass sometimes, you know, in this very shallow water. Um, but we definitely foul hook a lot of sand eels when we're using the needlefish. So as the needlefish is basically touching the bottom, touching the sand sometimes, you know, because you're, you're, you're talking about fishing in maybe two, two, three foot of water at the absolute most. Um, you know, so, yeah, we foul hook a lot of sand eels. So I know the sand eels are active at night and the bass are after them. So, um on the edge of these sort of beaches, you will have obviously the extremities. So, you know, if it's a bit quiet in the middle of the beach, then you can maybe move across. You know, if I've got two or three clients with me, I might put, you know, one client fishing the extremity, one in the middle, and then one other guy maybe fishing the other extremity, you know, because there's always going to be more food on the edges of these sort of beaches. Um, in the middle of the beach itself, as a tide drops down and the, top and the, uh, the waves start to turn on them, Again, if you've got sandbars or troughs, you know, some of them are permanent, some of them are, are they only there, you know, they're intermittent, basically, they're not there all the time. Um, if you've got troughs or sandbars, they're going to, the waves are going to turn around them. And again, you know, it's more likely to be bass activity there. Um, and again, if you've got isolated features or some kind of structure, it's not essential. But if you have got, you know, flat rocks or, um, you know, a weed bed or something like that, you know, then again, I'd always be putting that lure close to that because I do think that the bass use them. If they're not using them just to see if there's any food there, I actually think they're using them as like a navigation aid almost, you know. Um, and that links into like the invisible yet natural routes that I talked about. So if you can imagine, let's say, the edge of, you know, a, a bay, if you like, with rocks on either side of it, I do think at some stage in the tide, bass, particularly the bigger territorial ones, are going to cut right across that beach, you know. And also, if you've got areas where there's like a convergence, of um you know flat rocks and then sand again that that zone that area where those two um zones converge that's where again we've hooked so many fish and this is when the bass can be very very close to you you know um you know we've been stood ankle deep you know the, the needle fish has got to the rod tip and bang we've had a hit you know, I've, I've, we've actually had bass take the lure as the lures hit the rod tip. That's how close they are to you. So I can't see you. Um, that is a great example, again, of a temporary shallow surf beach. So over high tide, all of these rocks are going to be covered. You know, the water's going to be all the way up past this sand. All that's going to be covered. You know, but as the tide ebbs out of it, particularly on these bigger springs, you know, you're going to have that. Oh, geez. Right. So, um, so there's your extremities. You know, and the bass will root along those, or, or hide in there, or hunt in there. I don't think you can. I don't know if you can see it on this slide or not, but there's some very slight, deeper little troughs there. There's one there, and there's one darker area there, and I would say that's just like a deeper little trough that's just been sort of scurred out by the waves. And um, there's your isolated features, just circled in green there. Um, so that was your your sort of natural roots that linked into the extremities but this is the one that i'm talking about so there's your one 
promontory and there's another quite often the bass will just cut right across the beach right across just keep putting a lure out in that area at some stage you're going to get one and then there's a good example of a convergence quite close in there as well that would be somewhere where i would expect to catch a bass there right on the edge there in the dark right where that bit of weed is and that links into that sand love it and there's an example that's actually a very recent fish i actually caught that fish on boxing day um or, or boxing day night i wasn't even going to go out i was just sick of eating and drinking and whatever so i thought right it was a lovely evening and i went out to a beach um i knew the tide was dropping it's somewhere that's been really consistent for me and um yeah bang that one that was um about 71 centimeters that was on a gravity stick uh savage gear gravity stick what a lure that is so um as i said sorry to punt the books but um yeah like i said i've pretty much skimmed over um you know six different marks there but you can imagine the amount of detail that's in these books um and you know, the lure of the bass, you know, the, the, the Bass Angler Sport Fishing Society, they've very kindly written reviews on both books. Uh, Henry's done reviews on them. I think the Lure Angler Society did one recently on the on um, bass lure fishing at Guy's Perspective. So there's a few reviews out there. Um, happy to say they're all positive. <laughs> and um, but the first book, the Lure of the Bass, is 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 like like the um, the society review said. You know, it's very much like a user manual um you know it's a real how-to so that's the kind of book that you need to sort of go back to time and time again you know try things then go out and, and then try it again but like i say it, it chronicles you know how i how i basically worked out how to catch these fish you know i'm not saying it's the only way because it definitely isn't but it's just how i found it's how i basically taught myself how to catch these fish and then now teach others and then and the second book bass the fishing and guys perspective that's very much um anecdotal um and the first book sorry is 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 very much rock and reef orientated because that really was my bread and butter i would say um but i said the second book is much more inclusive of all the different types of marks that i fish so um you know the estuaries the the beaches the reefs the headlands but also the night fishing element to it because in the last five years i mean it's almost it's all it's only actually almost five years now that, it was, that i caught my first ever bass at night on a lure you know and um, by design so obviously caught <laughs> many 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 during the day but um the night fishing side of it was something that i really did want to crack but it was only it was just under five years ago now that i caught my first bass on a lure at night by design so yeah so that concludes the presentation are there any questions <laughs>